This is a response to P.P. Simmons' video, Oops, Even More Evidence for Intelligent Design. So, Carl, it's been a long time, and while they say that absence makes the heart grow fonder, I'm afraid that in your case that particular aphorism has been found somewhat wanting. As you might be aware, my last video was addressed at your odious lickspittle Mike Pisspan Shoesmith and that repulsive skid mark on the face of Christianity Richard Cockshite Garcia. You may also have heard that while I was rogering them roughly with their own stupidity, I did admit to having grown weary of the Sisyphean task of shoveling your and your fellow thought of us bumpkins' melodious thought processes up a seemingly endless hill. Thus, when your toadies somewhat predictably decided to ignore my perfectly reasonable counter to the conditions of their debate challenge, and instead tucked their tails between their legs and fucked off as expeditiously as possible, I was afforded the opportunity to take a well-earned sabbatical from creationist rectal stuffing, put my feet up and recharge my batteries. Having done so, the time has now come to pull on my wellies again, roll up my sleeves and step once more onto the breach, although it's likely that in the future the frequency of my ignoramus remage will probably be considerably reduced. To mark this occasion, it therefore seemed most fitting that I select a target from the unending flotsam-strewn strand that is creationist dumbfuckery, a turd that was jettisoned by the SS Carl Bollocks herself. So imagine my delight as I strolled along that fetid shore and came across this wonderful nugget you'd taken the time to anally express, and that splattered dab smack in the middle of my area of expertise, that is, protein chemistry. As usual though, it seems that you and the terminally confused simians at the P.P. Simmons channel were unable to come up with anything to say for yourselves, and instead resorted to dredging up a noxious screed by a Mr. Brian Thomas from the Institute of Creation Research, one that was originally excreted almost two years ago, thereby demonstrating how close you and your spunk monkeys are to the cutting edge of creation research. So without further ado, Carl, let's get back into the swing. I'd like to ask my subscribers to reach for the nearest waterproof receptacle and for you to assume the usual position as I play the first clip. The article explains, according to evolutionary theory, chemicals must have somehow organized themselves into cellular life, presumably billions of years ago. And that means that enzymes must have formed themselves too. As you and Mr. Thomas are well aware, Carl, the formation of the first replicating polymers and primitive cellular systems is the bailiwick of a field of study named abiogenesis. I know you know this because I've previously taken the time to insert this particularly threadbare canard headfirst up your back passage, while I contend that Mr. Thomas must have come across this tidbit at least once during his biological studies, unless of course he was too busy condemning people in the name of Jesus to have paid any attention in class. Regardless of whether or not the appearance of the first primitive life forms occurred via the action of natural processes or at the whim of an inscrutable cosmic enchanter, the fact remains that an insurmountable edifice of empirical evidence indicates that it occurred almost four billion years ago and was followed by continuous diversification ever since via an elegant bifurcating process of imperfect reproduction and natural selection. In either case, Carl, the same evidence fucks up the ass the cherished fables you and Mr. Thomas cling to like scared children at the back of the short bus and your repeated and repugnant dishonesty in trying to paint established science with the uncertainties inherent in emerging science is both deplorably shameful and a testament to how desperate you are and how low you'll stoop to attempt to bore your inexorably sinking belief system. Enzymes, though, appear to be highly engineered miniaturized machines. <laughs> Even intelligent human scientists armed with the most sophisticated technology have never been able to reproduce the design and manufacture of a single enzyme. So, logically, neither can unintelligent chemicals or the laws that govern them manufacture themselves. What a crock of shit, Carl. I have to admit, though, at being somewhat impressed at the depths of stupidity and ignorance that you and Mr. Thomas have plunged to in this segment. In fact, if you try just a little harder, you might well manage to disappear up each other's asses. Firstly, I'll point out your egregious non sequitur because I was amused by your use of the word logically, 
when in fact it's evident that you and Mr. Thomas wouldn't know what logic was if Mr. Spock himself strapped it on and used it to vigorously shag seven shades of shit out of you. Because it seems that by your own reasoning, I could equally legitimately argue that our inability as a sapient species to produce a delectable pair of mammalicious honkers using a bag of balloons and a packet of jello must therefore mean that they could also not be produced by unintelligent cells and that therefore all humongous womba jumbas are the result of the jug related juju of an invisible pervert in the sky. Of course, your logic also fails because of the question you're begging harder than an evangelist with an empty collection plate and a large unpaid hooker's bill. That is, of course, your unwarranted assumption that intelligence is an absolute requirement for the generation of protein complexity, while completely ignoring that we have no a priori reason to make that assumption and a mountain of a posteriori knowledge indicating that it's just a pile of steaming poo. But pretzel logic aside, Carl, your and Mr. Thomas's argument fails even harder than an abstinence-only program because he appears to be unaware that directed in vitro protein evolution is an established and successful area of research to such a degree that companies are producing patents, selling kits and even offering contract services in this area. The fact that Mr. Thomas appears to be oblivious to all this speaks volumes to either his abject ineptitude in the field in which he's chosen to defecate or his unfortunate cerebral impairment or to the magnitude of the lies he's willing to tell to defend your impotent god. Of course, he is a creationist, so all three may well apply. Not only did Mr. Thomas ignore a vast swathe of research as though it didn't exist, but this intensive work, which incidentally was carried out by highly intelligent and educated individuals dedicated to the discovery of new knowledge and not by arrogant, worthless wankstains dedicated to destroying it, has culminated in the production of novel enzyme activities from previously non-functional sequences. Thus, not only is Mr. Thomas demonstrably wrong on this point of fact, it so happens that these feats of protein engineering are achieved by the same processes of random mutagenesis and functional selection that he asserts could not possibly produce them. This, coupled to his eagerness to jump onto this ill-considered line of argumentation as eagerly as a priest volunteering to conduct a pubic louse inspection after choir practice has unfortunately for both of you done nothing but ream your own god vigorously up his celestial bunghole. You see, Carl, with the evidence I've presented in hand, and the evidence of the sudden poofing into existence of functional enzymes out of nothing distinctly not in hand, our observations of the real world tell us that the only known way enzymes are formed is via a mixture of stochastic and targeted naturalistic processes, and not by the methodical design and manufacture by intelligent agents, be they transcendental or otherwise. Thus it seems that the score that indicates enzymes were formed naturally has increased by one, while the score for them having been created capriciously by the judicious use of pixie dust remains what it's always been, that is absolutely bugger all. The title of a recent scientific report asserted that a particular enzyme evolved. It was in Nature magazine. The title of the report was Evolution of a New Enzyme. The study results, however, clearly demonstrate that this enzyme could not have evolved and was purposely created. I felt the need to comment here because Nature is arguably the world's most prestigious journal and publishes research from the very cutting edge of all aspects of science. It's therefore mind-boggling to see that Mr. Thomas apparently feels that his master's degree and utter lack of research experience has equipped him to publicly defecate over its contents. While I've been labelled as arrogant on a number of occasions for opining on areas in which I've been extensively educated, at least I possess sufficient humility to restrict my bloviation to such areas. One can only begin to imagine the enormity of the bloated and self-satisfied ego that gives a mediocre simpleton like Mr. Thomas the temerity to feel that he knows better than those who've proved themselves where he most definitely has not and whose buttock sweat he's unfit to mop up with his tongue. Now, of course, lacking training and qualifications does not mean per se that his arguments are erroneous, and it may be that Mr. Thomas is an unsung extraordinary genius possessed with insights that have somehow escaped the authors of this paper, who have dedicated their lives to studying this particular specialized field of science, not to mention the similarly expert reviewers that accepted the manuscript. 
However, based on what I've already presented, I would posit that the possibility is somewhat remote, and furthermore, in due course, I will be providing additional demonstrable evidence that he is in fact nothing of the sort, but rather a jumped up little fucktard with delusions of his own competence. The investigators compared the three-dimensional structures of similarly shaped enzymes that are found in different species of bacteria. Studies confirmed that the core structure of the CS2 hydrolase, like that of similar enzymes, is critical. The scientist wrote in Nature, quote, any change in this area of the enzyme adversely affected protein activity. On the one hand, evolution story requires that at some point in time, something altered what would become the enzyme core. And not only once, but again and again, as each structural piece evolved into place over eons of time. On the other hand, science observably demonstrates that altering the enzyme core in the slightest way is impossible without making the whole structure useless. Any biochemistry undergraduate knows that mutations at an active site are much more likely to be deleterious than those at the enzyme periphery, where structural changes are less likely to propagate into alterations in active site geometry. Furthermore, most changes in residues involved in the actual catalytic mechanism or ones that sterically interfere with substrate accessibility are also more likely to be deleterious. Unfortunately for you, Carl, Mr. Thomas has yet to demonstrate that he has more than an undergraduate level of understanding in this subject, and in fact, from what he's demonstrated so far, it appears that he's operating at or below an F. You notice that I used the word most when I mentioned active site mutations, whereas your Muppet used the somewhat more ambitious and, as it turns out, entirely unwarranted word all. You see, Carl, if Mr. Thomas paid more attention in class or perhaps attended some more prestigious institutions instead of the Texas backwaters he's familiar with, he might have discovered that a whole multi-billion dollar industry has arisen around the production of industrial enzymes with artificially enhanced activity, stability or selectivity. Since I've had the benefit of an education that he's unfortunately apparently been deprived of, I was aware of this fact. But rather than citing work that could easily fill a library, I'll instead give you this excellent review that provides over 50 examples of such improvements. And while not all of these mutations are to the active site, it took me less than a minute to find this example of a 50% increase in the specificity of protease BYA via an active site mutation. Thus Mr. Thomas's claim that evolution by stepwise improvements in the active site is impossible is immediately rendered as impotent as an apologist hooked up to a lie detector and can be summarily rammed up his jacksy by anyone who cares to do so. Furthermore, Mr. Thomas is also operating under the same cognitive dysfunction as most of his fellow creationists, who apparently cannot conceive of the concept that early enzymes were most likely nowhere near as efficient as their descendants. Early enzymes, therefore, explored a much flatter fitness landscape as they evolved, and had many more favorable mutations available to them than their much more specialized modern counterparts. Thus, when Mr. Thomas delightedly proclaims that active site mutations cannot have resulted in evolution in early enzymes because they are generally detrimental in extant ones, he's committing an egregious category error and might as well be comparing Kate Moss's tits with Pamela Anderson's. Of course, the average creationist, and Mr. Thomas is rapidly proving himself to be very average, wouldn't recognize a logical fallacy if it kicked him repeatedly in the balls with a steel-tipped winkle picker, so perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that this eluded him, or you for that matter, Carl. Now getting back to the paper in question here, what Mr. Thomas has neglected to mention is that only five active site mutations were generated by the authors and that in reality, both real evolutionary processes and human protein engineers explore vast fitness landscapes by generating millions of mutants to produce the rare changes that improve activity. Perhaps even more egregiously, Mr. Thomas also fails to point out that three other mutations generated by the group actually doubled the enzyme's efficiency, and while these weren't in the active site, it does seem that revealing their existence would have compromised the story he was so assiduously peddling. With this kind of selective data mining, therefore, I would suggest that everyone ask themselves whether these are the actions of an individual truly engaged in an honest and unbiased assessment of a piece of scientific research, 
or those of a despicably dishonest and vile streak of shit who's interested only in pushing his own agenda harder than a paedophile with a puppy in a playground. The researchers found a clue in the DNA that suggested to them an idea of how the enzyme could have evolved. They said the DNA that codes for certain structures within the CS2 hydrolase gene could have, quote, jumped from another bacteria to this one. Perhaps some unknown cellular mechanism, quote, stitched it in. This little extra bit, at just the right place, among the bacteria's 1.8 million DNA bases. <laughs> The unknown mechanism, as he refers to it, is called transposition and it won Barbara McClintock a Nobel Prize in 1983. Again, Mr. Thomas might have been aware of this had he been listening to his lecturers during his class rather than to the Mormon tabernacle choir on his fucking iPod. Of course, it's equally possible that Mr. Thomas is lying like a Catholic in a confessional again or that he didn't even read the paper he's violating because the authors clearly state that the CS2 hydrolase gene is in fact sandwiched by transposable elements. As to why Mr. Thomas places so much emphasis on its exact genomic location, I am at a loss since it appears that the authors didn't think it important enough to mention it at all. I wonder whether he decided to fish this out whole cloth from between his buttocks in order to falsely inflate his claim that the existence of anything more complex than his thought processes necessitates the existence of his particular ephemeral gin. And even if the insertion site were significant, I think we can safely wager that it would not have occurred to Mr. Thomas that this could have been achieved as effectively by millions of random insertion events followed by selection of the appropriate lineage using mundane physical processes that have been repeatedly observed and verified as it could once by the use of a mystic incantation that has never been observed by anybody. But if that fairy tale story is so, could this process properly be called evolution? Well, of course not. If the gene jumped from another bacteria to this one, then it did not evolve because it already existed somewhere else. Well, Carl, it seems that Mr. Thomas hasn't yet come up with that insight that would save him from being labeled an irredeemable simpleton. Did he completely forget about figure one in the paper? A cladogram that occupies the best part of a page and shows how CS2 hydrolase is related to modern beta-carbonic anhydrases and so evolved from a common ancestor. Apparently he did, along with the extensive discussion on the topic in the paper. The possibility that CS2 hydrolase in this species may have been acquired by horizontal gene transfer doesn't mean that it magically materialized at the behest of a cosmic tinkerer, just that it evolved elsewhere as demonstrated by the essentially conclusive phylogenetic evidence. Interestingly, the paper notes that only some species of the order Sulfolobales contain the CS2 hydrolase activity and how this is elegantly explained by its evolution elsewhere and its subsequent transfer into only some members of that clade. This is yet another striking example of the explanatory power of science in general and evolutionary biology specifically, an example that Mr. Thomas conveniently neglected to mention in his hatchet job and which I suspect he would have trouble explaining without arbitrarily referring to the whims and vagaries of an emotionally stunted pan-dimensional space wizard. But in order for a lateral gene transfer to even work, in addition to the enzymes themselves, another mechanism had to already exist that could recognize, accept, and insert the foreign DNA at just the right place. Only then could it retrofit an enzyme in just the right way to enable the bacterium to live on sulfur. Jumping back to yet another unsubstantiated claim of irreducible complexity, eh, Carl? How very predictable of you, Tards. Of course, this game could go on ad infinitum because it's childishly simple for even indomitable cretins like you to pick any complex biological process and assert out of your seemingly endless ignorance that it could not possibly have evolved. While it takes a considerable amount of time for someone with intellectual integrity to research the field and produce a considered and well-referenced rebuttal to your cranial flatulence. Since I don't have an infinite amount of time at my disposal to chase after this particular white rabbit, and since I think I've demonstrated that everything that Mr. Thomas excretes should be taken with a kilogram of salt, I think I'll move on to the next clip. Where's the evidence here for evolutionary innovation? 
pre-existing DNA and pre-existing DNA transfer and pre-existing splicing programs appear to have existed from the beginning. The authors of the article asserted that CS2 hydrolase, quote, emerged owing to the evolution of a new protein structure, end quote. But this statement ignores the fact that no new DNA actually emerged. Once again, Carl, either Mr. Thomas didn't read the paper, is as monumentally stupid as you are, or is a lying splat of syphilitic jizz who fished this piss-poor excuse of a thought out of the same place that you get all your videos. I'm going to ignore the mind-numbing inanity of you and Mr. Thomas apparently thinking that the acquisition of a new gene and thus a concomitant new and significant physiological function by an organism somehow doesn't count as an evolutionary innovation, presumably because said organism is still a bacterium and not a fucking frog. Instead, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. The authors of the paper clearly indicate how CS2 hydrolase is phylogenetically related to and so emerged from an ancestral carbonic anhydrase and how it differs from that enzyme due to its ability to form a hexadecameric catenane quaternary structure and also due to the presence of a characteristic double phenylalanine motif near its active site that explains its differing substrate specificity. Just because Mr. Thomas decided to ignore these somewhat salient points and instead pontificate on a veritable shoal of red herrings that he pulled effortlessly from the recesses of his lower digestive tract, and just because you were too lazy, uninterested or stupid to fact-check him, Carl, doesn't mean that they were not made. In fact, it seems rather telling that Mr. Thomas chose this subterfuge rather than thinking of refutations for what was actually presented, suggesting that perhaps he was unable to furnish any such refutations and instead decided to bypass his inconvenient clash with reality by lying like a Wall Street banker to a congressional subcommittee. And the proper placement of the so-called transferred DNA required just the opposite of evolution. It required intelligent, purposeful design. Carl, had you bothered to spend the time to read the actual nature paper itself instead of uncritically swallowing Mr. Thomas's excrement and throwing it all up indiscriminately all over your channel, you would have realized that the proper placement he mentioned is nothing but a figment of his fevered imagination. Of course, I expect nothing less from you, Carl, because you're an ignorant buffoon with absolutely no interest in discovering whether you're right or wrong and with no respect for the gifts that have been bestowed upon you by the very people you smugly besmirch with every video you make. People who you feel in the apparent limitless depths of your conceit to be your inferiors and yet who to anyone even remotely plugged into reality obviously have minds that can be compared to finely tuned turbocharged Lamborghinis when compared to yours which is evidently more akin to a clapped out old golf cart with a dead battery, flat tire and a stale piss stain on the driver's seat. It's because of this that I make no effort to reach you or your kind, Carl, because you've proved time and time again that you don't care one jot for things like reason and beauty and truth. You're only interested in perpetuating your own beliefs. Beliefs you cannot and will not question because they've been handed down to you over hundreds of generations from primitive people who knew nothing of the natural world and so tried their best to explain it with the only tool they had available to them, their imaginations. And because of this, I actually feel a little sorry for you, Carl, because you and your fellow creationists are now forced to spend your days holding up a dam that's creaking and groaning against the unstoppable and ever-growing waters of knowledge that science is producing. A dam that threatens every day to finally burst from the unbearable strain and consume you in the resulting torrent, sweeping you and your like away into the annals of history to be looked at and laughed at by generations to come as nothing more than strange and inscrutable curiosities. Your inflexibility and dour insistence of looking back into the past rather than forward into the future has left you worshipping a woefully small and stunted god. A god of limited vision and simplistic motivations. A pitiful god that grows smaller every day as we grow more enlightened. And yet it needn't be so, Carl. Instead, you could be like the countless enlightened theists the world over, Christians included, who have opened their eyes to the grandeur of reality. 
who have gazed at the cosmos in wonder and realized that their god is so much more magnificent than their ancestors could ever have imagined. They worship a god that created an unfathomably vast universe that has coalesced slowly over billions of years from nothing but pure energy to one that is the home of exquisite galaxies teeming with stars around which silently move planets containing wonders yet unimagined and unimaginable. They worship a god that created at least one place and possibly many, many more where life could grasp a first tentative foothold a god that put into motion an exquisitely simple yet elegant set of rules that allowed it to diversify over countless millennia to produce an ever-changing kaleidoscope of wonder and beauty. A kaleidoscope that continues to slowly turn to this day and from which endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. But instead of grasping eagerly at this new vision of reality, Carl, a vision hard won that's been carved out of the granite of our ignorance by those you choose to slander and defame at every opportunity, instead of embracing it and all the positive implications it has about the god you claim to worship, you and your kind choose to demean that god by labeling it as a petty conjurer that creates out of mud and tawdry parlor tricks. As you know, Carl, I'm not a religious man. But if it happened that we lived in a universe where both these gods existed, I know which one I'd be worshipping. This is your brain. And this is your brain when you don't subscribe to Dangerously Talented. Any questions? Any questions?